I know this man's been in jail. That impresses me. <laughs> I did identify. I think we're going to hear a great story this morning. I'm looking forward to it. I give you Kip C. from Southern California. <laughs> My name's Chip Collins, and I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety dates May 12, 1984. My home group is the Vista Men's Hole in the Wall in Vista, California, and it's the best meeting in Southern California. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for allowing me to participate in my recovery. Um, I love the South. I used to spend a lot of time back here hiding out from the law in Southern California. You know, uh, I always get nervous every time I get it. Ain't, I don't mind speaking, but every time I wear a suit, it brings on old feelings. I'm either going to sentencing or I'm getting married, you know. And that, <coughs> neither one of those were very comfortable for me. <laughs> My father is a half Sioux and half Irish. My mother's Cherokee and Irish. And when my father drank, it was interesting. <laughs> my mother didn't drink, but my mother liked to fight. And uh, she amazed me. She was the bravest woman or the stupidest woman I've ever known. I, I, I love her with all of my heart. My mom is my hero. But that old man would come home drunk every night, and, and if you just be quiet, he'd pass out and go to sleep, but she'd sit up and wait for him. And uh, she'd jump on him, and it'd get going. And the last words was, go ahead and hit me, you son of a bitch. And bam, he'd oblige her. And, uh, and the next night, she'd sit up and wait for him. And the next night, and the next night, and it was like that until I was about 12 years old. She just, i just stand there in amazement. God, you know what's going to happen, Mom, you know. I ain't letting him get away with it, you know. So God bless her. I don't tell you that to blame my alcoholism on my father because my father, my father was a great teacher and he taught me exactly what alcohol will do to a family. He taught me what it would do to children. He taught me what it would do to a, to a marriage. And he taught me what it would do to a man. You know, and he was a good example of what not to do. And I was never going to drink. I was never going to be like that man, you know. It was absolute terror. We live, I live real close to the border of Mexico. In the neighborhood I grew up in, it was, I, I was the only person, me and my brother, we were 11 months apart. We had uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, and everybody else was Hispanic, and they didn't speak English, and we didn't fit in that neighborhood. And I went to see my cousins, and my cousins are all, they have dark brown eyes, dark hair, and dark skin, and we didn't fit in with that family. And we couldn't figure out what was going on, you know. And we went out of that house, and those Mexicans wanted to beat my ass. And I came in that house, and that crazy father of mine wanted to beat my ass. And uh, I stand in that doorway. I was scared to death to go in the house or go out of it. <clears throat> and that caused something to happen in Kip, you know, because uh, I found out at an early age that if I could act crazier than any one of you, and if I could keep you in fear of me, you would leave me alone. And that's the way I ran my life. You know, I can remember the day that I really put that all together. My, my mom, she just, she's the greatest mom in the world. And we were pretty poor, but she saved her money, and I was her oldest son. And, I, and she bought me this little suit. It was my very first day of kindergarten. I remember that day crystal clear. I set a whole pattern in my life. And she bought me this little suit and had a little beanie hat, you know, and a... A little blue blazer with a little thing here, right here, you know, and a bow tie and little short pants. And, uh, and she was dressing me, and I was knowing what's going to happen, you know. But I loved my mama, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings. And, and my mama walked me down to that school, and there's all these Mexican kids, and they're standing there leaning against the wall in their T-shirts and Levi's and tennis shoes, looking at Lord Pomperoy walking down the hall. <laughs> and then my mama left me there. And I don't have to tell you what happened, you know, but it never happened again. You know, it never happened again. 
You know, I'd, uh, in my story, I respect the singleness of purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous with all of my heart, believe me, but drugs are part of my story. I was never, ever going to be an alcoholic. But when I was 12 years old, in school, they were decided it was time to lecture the young people about uh, drugs. And they brought in these people, and they, they showed this film, and they started talking about this stuff called marijuana. And I watched that film, and I listened to it explain to you what, what it did to you and how it made you feel. And I was filled with anticipation. <laughs> And I just, I just said, that, stuff, that sounds marvelous, you know. And I, I asked my buddy Balto, I said, Balto, do you know where we can get some of this stuff? And he says, yeah. He says, my dad smokes that shit, you know. And I, I said, well, see if you can get some. So he got some. I couldn't get there. I said, did you get it? And he said, yeah. And so he showed me this funny little rolled cigarette, you know. And he says, now, we've got to drink cheap wine with this. <laughs> and I, I said, Why? And he says, I don't know, my old man does. And uh, <laughs> So we went down to this can, in, a little liquor store down in our neighborhood, and we each of us stole a short dog of port wine. And I uh, went down this canyon, and I smoked this dope and drank this wine. And I fell in love for the first time in my life. You know, something happened inside of me that only you people will understand. For the very first time in my life, I felt like a whole human being. I felt just as good as I knew you people felt, you know. And, and all of a sudden, it was all perfectly clear. And I understood the first three steps of recovery a long time before I got into recovery, you know, because I knew that I was powerless over this world and my life was unmanageable and I was scared and I was terrified of this world. I smoked this dope and I drank this wine and I came to believe that there was a power greater than myself, you know. <laughs> And when I experienced that power, I immediately turned my will and life over it with no reservations. You know, and I never, ever looked back. When I was 14 years old, I got kicked out of school for hitting a teacher. They said I was antisocial. And uh, I got home, and my mom had found my dope. And uh, this always amazed me. My mom let my father practice his disease in our house for many, many years. And she found my marijuana and she said, you get the hell out of my house. And, uh, and I left. I, I lived in a little tiny town. There was about 800 people that lived in this town. I'd never been anywhere, never done anything. But I was over at a friend of mine's place and we we're reading in the newspaper. And they got this deal going on up in San Francisco. And they said, said, check this out, Kip. He says, all these people do is get high and make love and listen to music. I loved the first two, and I'd really been wanting to get involved in the third one, you know. So uh, I went to a place called Haight-Ashbury in 1964, and I got an education. I lived there for the next three years. I lived on 228 Haight, right in the center of it, and uh, right next to the Fillmore Auditorium. And I learned a manner of living that other people didn't get to learn. I learned at a very early age. You see, my father had also told me that if I wanted things in this life, I had to work hard, I had to go to school, I had to do this. He didn't do any of it, you know, but he'd like to tell me what to do, you know. And I found out he was crazy. I found out that if I had the bag, I could have anything I wanted and anybody I wanted, you know. And that's the way I'm nothing I'm proud of, but that's the way I lived. I started smuggling drugs across the Mexican border when I was 16 years old two years before I was old enough to cross the border, and I got arrested down there with 400 pounds of marijuana, and I went to prison in Mexico at the age of 16 years old. And I'll tell you this, in Mexico, prisons are not real nice. And nice things don't happen to young white men in Mexican prisons. And that should have been enough to scare me, but you see, it wasn't. And I got out of there, and I came back to the United States, and I... Uh, and I continued to live the way I lived and do the things that I do. And on my 18th birthday, I was arrested with a gun in my mouth at uh, 5.30 in the morning and charged with 27 felonies. And the minute I was old enough to go to prison in the United States, I was there. You know, they didn't waste no time. And uh, I got another kind of an education in there. I, made, uh, I learned how to be a criminal, and I learned how to do things right. 
And when I got out of there, you know, I, I, I continued to do what I was doing. And, you know, this gal, that it, when I first went in there, I'd been running with this one gal, and she was a, come from a real, real nice family. And they hated my guts, you know. <laughs> I couldn't figure out why, but... Uh, I figured they were prejudiced. They were Mexican, and I wasn't, you know, so... And that little girl got pregnant. And when I was in that prison, she had a baby. And when I got out of there, I tried to find her, and her family wouldn't let me anywhere near that house or anywhere near her or give me any information. And, and I'll tell you this. I didn't tell you, you know, but um, when I was young and I would lay in bed at night waiting for that old man to get home, me and my brother used to talk about the kind of men we wanted to be when we grew up and the kind of fathers we wanted to be and the kind of husbands we wanted to be. And I wanted to be, a, you know, other kids used to talk about what they wanted, how they were going to do this. All I ever wanted to be was a father all my life. I wanted kids. I just loved kids. And I, I wanted to have a kid worse than anything in this world. And I tried to find that little girl, and I couldn't find her. Nobody gave me any information. So when I got up, I started running around with this other gal, you know. She, uh, she bailed me out of jail three times in one week. <clears throat> and I figured that was true love. It was good enough for me. You know, she was 15 years old and she woke up a judge at 3 o'clock in the morning to make bail for me. And I said, baby, I ain't ever letting you out of my life. <laughs> so I married her, you know, and, and two years later, uh, we had a little boy. And for you that have, parent, have children, I think you know what I'm talking about. You know, they brought that little boy out and they put him in my arms in that hospital and, uh, and something magic happened to me inside here because... I, I fell in love with a human being for the first time in my life. First time in my life, I really experienced love. And I looked at this son, and I, I oh, it was just magic, man. I was the highest I've ever been in my life. And I thought about, and I made all these plans and dreams of what kind of father I was going to be and the things I was going to do with him, the things we were going to do together, all the things that I had never got to do when I was a young man. You know, and, and a couple of years later, I had a little girl. And it was the same thing. They brought her out and they put her in my arms. And, and you know, I'm an alcoholic and I like to project, so I'm immediately thinking about, well, God, some guy's going to come and ask me to marry her someday, you know. And uh, I mean, she's an hour old. I get things planned, you know. And, uh, and I started planning, planning the wedding, you know, the kind of wedding I'm going to give her and, and the kind of father I'm going to be and all this stuff, you know. And, uh, and I'll tell you this, you know, that I was a good father. I was a good father for a long time. I had a lot of money. I had a place in Mexico. I had a place in San Francisco. And I had a nice place in Southern California. I owned a, a legal business that made an awful lot of money. And I spent most of my time with my children. And I played with them. Cause I'm a child. I really identified with Reggie because I am a child at heart, man. I, I am most comfortable with little children, you know. I love to play jacks. <laughs> and one day, September 6, 1976, things in my life changed dramatically. I do not believe at this time that I was alcoholic, and I do not believe that I was a drug addict. Uh, I was very cautious about what I did. I was the business that I was in. I, I had to be real careful, and you don't make mistakes. I noticed early on in my life that when I drank alcohol, I did stupid things. And when you do what I do, you don't need to do stupid things too often. And I didn't want anyone to notice me. So I kept a very low profile. But on September 6th, someone brought me over some, some good dope, and I, and I started smoking that stuff. And, I, and it was a hot day, and like I guess in Southern California in September, and I was playing with my son in the garage. And... And I got on my bike, and I didn't tell anyone. You know, my son was, I didn't tell you, but he's, he was deaf. And, uh, and you had to watch him all the time because he'd wander around. You couldn't find him, and you had to keep your eye on him. And, and I got stoned, and I got on my bike, and I didn't think anything about it, and I took off to the store to go get something to drink. And when I came back, I, uh, my house was surrounded. The police were there, and the, the ambulances were there. And I, I waited in there, and my son had chased me out of the driveway, and I didn't notice it, and a truck had run over him. And I waited through the crowd, and I found my son, and his head was split open, and I could see his brains, and most of the bones in his body were broken. 
and the thing I love more than anything in this world, you know, that I take the responsibility to take them care of. You know, I got loaded and I dropped the ball. And my, my son lived. He, he was in a coma for nine months. And I was the first time that I tried to make a deal with this God that I didn't know anything about. But I begged God to give me my son back. I'll do anything if you give me my son back. And I cry and beg and I sat at that hospital. And my son lived, but he had massive brain damage and he never, never got past the age of about four or five years old mentally. And he had incredible problems. We went through 27 major brain surgeries through his life. And, a, and it was always one thing after another. And every time we'd have to go to the hospital, I knew that I was responsible for that. And things in my life started changing. I had, to, I had all these feelings of guilt and, all, and this picture in my mind that I, I couldn't get rid of of my son laying in the street. Same time, this my brother who was the closest friend of my life ever had. He was the best friend I've ever had in my life. I mean, we backed each other's play right or wrong under any circumstances and against any odds. And he was always there for me. My brother came down with a personality disorder called schizophrenia. That's one of the most insidious diseases known to man mentally. And my family had him committed to a hospital. My brother called me from this hospital after he had been there for a while and through some drugs and some therapy. He had kind of got a little bit of grip on things and he said, get me out of here, man. And he's my brother, man. I, you know, I said, okay. And I, and I got money and I got a lawyer and I got conservatorship of my brother and I bought him a trailer and I got him out of that hospital and I set him up alongside me and I, and I gave him money and he got away from his doctors and he got away from everything and and he started deteriorating one more time. And, and, and I, was, I was a big deal, and I was doing a lot of traveling, and I had to go back, come back here to the Midwest, to Oklahoma, and do some business. And uh, my brother was crying. He was saying, I don't know what's going on. I'm coming apart, man. And I'm going, well, you know what? I said, I'll be back in three days, bro. I said, me and you have always, it's always been me and you. It always will be. I said, just hang tight, man. Just hang tight for three days. I'll be right back. I said, here's some money. I always figured money would fix anything, you know, and I, and I got back in the scam I was on, and it went sideways on me, and I ended up there for about two weeks, and when I got back, I went to go find my brother, and I couldn't find him, and I went to that little trailer I'd bought for him, and I, I knew before I opened the door, but I opened that door, and the third day, my brother had taken that money I gave him and bought a gun, and he blew his head off, and when I opened that door, his head and body was laying there at the foot of the door, and it was just a pile of maggots, you know, and it was just something big giant other piece of me died something else that I'd taken responsibility and the other person that I loved and trusted the most in the world I destroyed him you know and from that day on that was the day that was the day that I discovered with all of my heart that alcohol and narcotics work real well I tell you this story for one thing my drinking and my drugging is a little bit different than other people's but in the in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about the, the, those among us who got here with grave emotional mental disorders. And I'm one of those people. Because something inside of me broke that day. Because I see I had all these pictures and all this trauma that I'd been through. And, and, and I couldn't get it out. And all this guilt and all these feelings of remorse. And alcohol worked. And I tell you this from my heart to yours. I thank God for alcohol at the bottom of my heart. If it would not have been for alcohol, you would have a different speaker here tonight. I would have blown my brains out. But alcohol worked for me. It worked real, real good. It took away those feelings. It took away that picture. It took away all that stuff. It stopped that screaming in my brain. And I could live in this world somewhat. Things started to go, you know... Uh, my daughter came in, and, and I was shooting some dope one morning, and she came in, and she saw me fixing dope, and, and she said, Daddy, I thought needles were for sick people. And it was like a slap in the face, and I decided that uh, I needed to get some help, so I checked myself into the very first treatment center of many, many more to come. But, uh, and that was my first experience with A&A. &A. And these people came in there, these common drunks, you know, and uh, I'm looking down my nose at them. You see, I'm a drug addict, <clears throat> and I have a lot more class than any alcoholic, you know. 
And I'm looking down my nose at these people, and I'm talking, well, you know, if I ever have a problem with that, I might look you up, you know. And this lady, she just laughed at me, you know, and uh, they were good people, members of the hospital institutional committee. I came back, and, and Reggie talked about one of my favorite subjects is Mad Dog. My first experience with Mad Dog, I'd never even heard of it. A guy came over one night. My, my wife had left, run off with this other Coke dealer who was doing better than with me. And um, I was sitting there with my little girl trying to figure out what I was going to do. And this friend of mine came over with this big old jug of Mad Dog wine. And I said, what's that? He goes, it's called Mad Dog. <clears throat> Have a little sip. I came to the next morning on a wide-body jet with my little girl sitting next to me. And I looked around, the plane was empty, the stewardess was saying, we've landed. And I said, where am I? And she said, you're in Fort Lauderdale. And I said, Fort Lauderdale, Florida? And she goes, yep. I said, I hate Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And she goes, I don't know anything about that, pal, but you got one ticket, one way ticket, you got to get off the plane. So I got off that plane and I did what any good respecting alcoholic would do. I got a cab, got a room, and got a bottle of Jack Daniels and went to sit down and tried to figure out how to put this all together. <laughs> and that started, that started a series that, you know, of I share in a general way. I lived in five different states. I lived here in Memphis for a little bit. I lived in Georgia. I lived in Florida. I lived in Oklahoma, I lived in Texas, and every place I went, it was going to be different. Everywhere I went, I tell that little girl of mine, you know, I loved her with all my heart. I said, baby, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to get a house, we're going to go to church, you're going to go to school, and I'm going to be the kind of father that I dreamed about and that you're dreaming about. And I promise you that with a solemn oath. The only thing is, you see, I've been a criminal all my life. I've never had a job before, and I don't really know how to work or do anything. You know, I can put 10 tons of pot from Zootonnao to Boston, Massachusetts, but I've never filled out a, a job application before, you know, and I don't have a Social Security card, and I've never had an identification in my name before, and, I, and I've never functioned in society before, and, I, and it was very confusing. And people wanted you to keep paper trails of everything you do, and... Uh, and fell out all this stuff, and it was, I was just, I get so confused with everything that I would always gravitate towards my kind of people. Because I know how to make money, and I know how to live in this world. It's going to work for $4.50 an hour is for suckers, I'll tell you. <laughs> you know? And I would always get in the same kind of jams because, see, my drinking is progressing, and I'm not as smart as I was. And when I drink, I have to do whatever my mind tells me to do. And it tells me to do all kinds of stuff. I read you talking about whiskey, talking to you. I always, he said, let's do this. Let's do some of that. Let's do this. And, and I always have to leave. Because it would always lead to violence. Some of it would get hurt, and I would have to leave. And I, by the time my daughter was nine years old, I'd walk into some little flop house, a place where we were staying, and she would look at me, and she knew by the look of my face and the way I was walking if we were staying or going. We were in Oklahoma City, and I heard a man real bad. And I came in that house on a dead run, and she looked at me, and she grabbed a doll, and we ran out the back door. We got on this bus. And I said, baby, we're going back to California. And I passed out. And I, I came to in Gallup, New Mexico. And my little girl was sitting there, and she was crying and rocking back and forth. And I said, what's the matter, baby? And she said, Daddy, I'm so hungry. I said, as soon as this bus stops, I'll get you something to eat, honey. And she said, as soon as the bus stopped, I walked into this little liquor store and I got her a sandwich and I got me a bottle of wine because I'm sicker than a dog by now. And I got up to pay for that and I only had enough money for one or the other. And I had to put her sandwich back because I couldn't get back on that bus without a drink. There ain't no way in the world. It was absolutely impossible for me to get back on that bus without any alcohol. But the screaming was starting, those feelings would start. I was physically addicted to alcohol. We, me and my daughter had already been to the, seeing me in DTs and, and getting real sick from no alcohol. And she was more afraid. At the age of nine years old, my daughter understood alcoholism to the point she knew the alcohol was more important for me than food for her. You know, because I couldn't do anything unless I had alcohol in my body. And she understood that. But that look in her face when she saw, when I told her, I said, baby, we ain't got enough money. And she smelled that cheap wine one more time in my breath. It was a look that only another alcoholic has seen before in the eyes of someone they love. 
And I got back to California, and I hadn't seen my mama in a long time. And I took that little girl over there, and my mama took one look at me, and she looked at my little girl. Then she said, get the hell out of here. And I grabbed my little girl, and I said, where will we go? And she grabbed my little girl and said, we ain't going nowhere. You are. And thank God for my mom. She took my daughter. The next three years of my drinking was uh, on the streets. I was in and out of institutions, in and, in and out of jail. I lived on the side of the road, and I lived in the bushes. And I panhandled for wine. And I was an animal. I was panhandling for wine on a Sunday morning. I know it was Sunday because these people were going to church in front of this little store. And uh, this family pulled up in this little square four-door sedan. And this guy got out of his car, and he had a real short haircut, you know, and he was wearing a suit and tie. Kind of looked like me now. And uh, <laughs> had this square little wife and these square little kids sitting in the back of this car. I looked at him. My hair is down to about here. My beard's down to about here. I've been in the same clothes for two years, and a lot of things live on me besides me. <laughs> I look at this man, and I just go, my God, how can you live that way? You know, and I... <laughs> You're not free. I'm free. You see, I, I valued my freedom, you know. I had a condo on the beach. consisted of a little pile of uh, bamboo with a septic tank drained down into, and it smelled so bad nobody would go down there. And it was real private, and I had a good view of the ocean. And uh, it was close to this little store I panhandled at, and I was part of the local color, you know. And uh, I had it made in my mind. But I, this guy looked at me, and, and I... I never thought I could be humiliated anymore. And I didn't care what anyone thought about me. All I know is alcohol worked, and alcohol took away those feelings. And that's all I live for. The only thing I live, I live to drink, and I drink to live. And he looked at me, and it was a guy that I'd gone to school with. It was a guy that I'd known when I was real young, and he was one of those kind of people I hated. He came from a real nice family. He got good grades. Everyone liked him. You know, and I... He was in all the sports, and, uh, and I just couldn't stand people like that. But he got out, and he looked at me, and he gave me $2. And that was a jackpot for first thing in the morning, because I could buy a whole quart of wine, and that set me right for at least half the day. And he looked at me, and I could see his reflection of me in his eyes, and I turned around to go in that store, and I saw me in the, in the window of this store. And I saw what he saw. And I got real angry because, not a, about who I was, but I knew he was judging me, you know. And I went and got that wine. And that man wasn't judging me at all. That man's a real good friend of mine today, him and his wife and his children. And, and I ain't here to talk about religion because he got no place in Alcoholics Anonymous. But this is a good Christian family. And they got down on their knees in that parking lot and they paid, prayed for that poor drunk. They weren't judging me. About the time that people were praying for me, I was sitting in my bamboo patch opening that bottle of wine, and I, and I had the damnedest thought I'd had in years. I said, I remember what those people told me at that first H&I A&A meeting I went to. And they said, if you're ever having a problem with alcohol, you might want to give Alcoholics Anonymous a shot. It was real hard to get any denial going that morning. And I, you know... I have, to this day, I've thought about it, thought about it, and thought about it. I have no idea how. But I ended up at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. It was a real small meeting. I have no idea how I found it or anything about it. I cannot remember. But I do remember this, that those people had told me if I came to AA, people would welcome me with open arms. And I walked in there, and these people looked a lot like y'all. All nice and clean cut, you know, and you all had cars out there and you were smiling and laughing and it didn't look like any kind of drunks I'd ever seen. You know, and I was wondering if they had a room for the more severe cases. <laughs> and I, right away you guys were talking about God and uh, I saw you pass a basket and I said, they're going to start singing pretty soon. I've seen this before. <laughs> And I'm getting ready to get my hat. You know, I noticed this one old gal. She kept looking at me from the minute I walked in. 
And I knew I didn't have anything she wanted. <clears throat> and uh, she kept smiling at me. She kept trying to get my eyes smiling at me. And I was getting real nervous. And all these, you know, no one welcomed me to that meeting. I'll tell you that. I walked in. People moved over. I smelled real bad, you know. And you looked at me real close, you'd see something dark from there to there, you know. And, um, and I'm sitting there. I'm getting ready to get the hell out of there. I knew this wasn't for me. And, and that lady saw me getting ready to leave. And she stood up and she introduced herself. She said, that when I walked in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous 27 years ago in Santa Monica. She goes, I walked in and I looked at y'all, and y'all look so nice and clean, especially you ladies. You look like ladies. She goes, I've been a prostitute all my life on the streets of Santa Monica, and I'd done everything a woman ever had to do to live out there on the streets, and I knew how ladies like you judge ladies like me. She goes, and I knew you wouldn't welcome me, and I looked, and I turned around to leave, but someone grabbed my arm and brought me a cup of coffee and begged me to stay and told me that they needed me to please keep coming back. And she proceeded to talk about the next 27 years of her recovery and about her family and her career and about all the miracles that had happened. And she kept looking right at me. And then she walked right over in front of all those good people who didn't want nothing to do with me. And she grabbed me up in her arms and she hugged me as tight as she could hug. And she kissed me right square dead on the mouth as the bravest woman I ever met. <laughs> I tell you, only a street hooker from Santa Monica could have done that, you know. And she looked me in the eyes and she said, Honey, she said, Please come, keep coming back here. We need you so bad. And I started crying. And I hadn't felt those feelings in so long. And nobody in this world had touched out any kind of feelings of care or love that was really genuine in a long, long time. And I started coming to this A&A. But you see, you people lied to me the first time, right off the bat. You told me if I'd stop drinking, things would get better. <laughs> Now, I don't know about y'all's drinking. I'll tell you about mine. My problems, I don't have any problem with alcohol. Alcohol has caused me some problems in my life. My problem is I have an acute allergic reaction to sobriety. You know? <laughs> and I would stop drinking. I'd stop drinking, and, and they also told me to get a sponsor. I've had parole officers most of my life. I don't want another one. I ain't going to volunteer for one. You know, I saw all those steps and said that I have to make a list and admit it to another human being. I was in prison in Mexico, and I learned when I was a young, young kid that you don't cop to nothing, even if they got pictures, you know. <laughs> I, I deny it, demand a jury trial, hope for the best, you know. You don't give nobody any information on you. Never give yourself up. Never show a weakness to another man or a woman. They'll use it against you. You know, I'd listen to you people spill your guts. I'd be so sorry for you. I'd be so embarrassed for you, you know. And I, I'd go, oh my God. And I just like to sit in the back. I like to go to speaker meetings back then, you know. I just go to speaker because you don't have to do too much. You just, you know, drink coffee and listen. Be quiet. Nobody will bother you too much, you know. Nobody will ever ask you to do anything. And that's where I wanted to be. I didn't want no one to ask me to do nothing, you know. I just wanted to be have your sobriety rub off on me and I'll tell you this with anyone you in these rooms you can stay sober on other people's recovery for a little while for a little while but recovery is a hell of a lot more than not drinking alcohol because alcohol is not my problem it is my solution for living in this world and my solution wasn't working no more I went to Alcoholics Anonymous for six years on a regular basis and the longest I ever got was 30 days But I was going to do it my way. <laughs> I woke up on, at the Vista County Jail Christmas morning, 1983, in the rubber room, butt naked, handcuffed, covered with blood. Didn't know if it was mine or someone else. Scared to death to ask. You wake up and you're in that rubber room and you roll over on your back and you look up in that little window and you see all the cops looking at you and laughing. You know it's not going to be a good day, you know. In your heart of hearts, you just know it's not going to be a good day, you know. And uh, I found out that I'd gotten a little drunk the night before. I had an argument with a police officer and, and lost rather badly. And uh, they let me out. You know, I was just a common drunk. They were used to seeing me. I was there on a regular basis, you know. They always told me to keep coming back. I was always good for a laugh. 
<clears throat> and they released me, and I got out of that place, and, uh, and I wasn't coming back here. AA don't work for people like me. I'm that person they talk about in Chapter 5. I ain't never going to get sober, and I'm tired of being y'all's token drunk, you know. I went back to my place. I had a little tiny, tiny little apartment, you know, and I had a little bit of money. Because if you stick around AA and come to these meetings, you get a little bit of functional, you know, and a few little things will happen to you. And, and I had a little measly little job, and I was making a little bit of money here and there. And, and I took all this money, and I went and spent every single bit of it on tequila and cocaine. And I went and sat in this room, and I started drinking this tequila and shooting this cocaine. And then... The next most important day of my life happened. And that was September 6th, at 6.30, 1984. Excuse me, January 6th. January 6th. Alcohol stopped working. And drugs stopped working. And I remember that crystal, crystal clear. It was the scaredest I've ever been in my whole life. And I've been in some real scary situations, but I've never been more terrified in my life than that moment. Because I reached that point that talks about in a vision for you. It says there'll come a time where you will not be able to imagine life with alcohol or without it. And I'll tell you, I know what that means from the bottom of my soul. It says you know loneliness such as few human beings can imagine. You know, and at that time, if loneliness would have been a tangible thing, it would have absolutely eaten me alive. He said, you come to the jumping off spot and you wish for the end. And right then and there, I thought about it. I knew I couldn't come back here. But AA didn't work for me. And alcohol didn't work no more. It didn't stop the screaming in my head. It didn't take out those pictures. It didn't take away the feeling. It started amplifying it. And it got worse and worse. And I couldn't drink enough. And I couldn't get enough dope in my body to stop this stuff. And I pulled out my gun and put it to my heart and I pulled the trigger and it blew me against the wall and it blew out my left lung and two ribs. And I looked down at this hole in my chest and I saw the blood pumping and I thank God, thank God this is over with. Just let me out of here. Just let me out of here. And then I come to in this damn room in a hall. Y'all thought I died, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Came to in this hospital. I got tubes coming out of every hole in my body and a few new ones I'd made. And, and there was this old man, a guy named Charlie Tuck. He's passed on now, and I'll break his anonymity. I hated this man. He was one of them old timers, you know, that look at you like that, shake their head. Came up to me in a meeting one time. Got me, looked me dead in the eye on this table. And he smiled. This guy used to be Al Capone's bodyguard. He was a real gangster. He looked me right square in the eye and he said, You think you're pretty tough, don't you, kid? I gave him my best jailhouse look. I said, Yeah. I said, I'm tough, all right. And he looked at me and he smiled. He says, You ain't tough. He says, You're the scaredest son of a bitch in this room. <laughs> He said, that might make you dangerous, but it don't make you tough. <laughs> and he walked away laughing at me. My greatest fear I have ever had in my life was that you men were going to see how terrified I was. I would do anything in this world to you guys to prove to you I wasn't afraid of you. I'll gunfight you, I'll knife fight you, I'll do anything in this world, but inside I'm dying. I am scared to death. I am still that little kid standing in the doorway. I'm scared to go in that house and I'm scared to go out. And I built this wall of fear around me. And this guy saw right through it. And I walked in, I'd go into a meeting. Every time I walked in, I'd look in that meeting. Ah, that son of a bitch is here. I ain't going in there. And I come to that morning in that hospital. And that's something, he's right at the foot of my bed with two newcomers. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to lay there with my eyes, I don't want to see that I'm coming to, you know, because I don't want to talk to him. He probably wanted some advice on something, you know. And <laughs> he didn't say a word to me. He had these two newcomers with him. 
And he put his arm around both of them and he said, you see this guy right here? And he went, yeah. I say, this is what happens when you don't work the steps. <laughs> says, come on, we're going to a meeting. He never said one word to me. I was mortified and humiliated. He obviously didn't know how sensitive I was. I got out of the hospital. I ain't going to do it. I ain't coming back to this damn place, you know. And uh, one of my old partners, he had just made the scam a scam come true. He made $7 million on this deal. And uh, he came and picked me up. He says, come on, Kip. He says, I got this big house on the hill. I got the best looking woman you ever met. We got the good, we got everything. Come on. We went up on this hill, big old mansion. And we started doing all that stuff. And alcohol didn't work. And you women didn't work. And dope didn't work. And nothing worked. I was dead inside. It was a desert of loneliness, of emptiness, of hopelessness. And I just wanted to die. I wanted to die worse than anything in this world. I just wanted it to stop. On May 12, 1984, I opened my eyes. And God had touched me right square on the forehead. Because usually my first thought when I open my eyes is I want something to drink, <laughs> you know, right now. That was the first. I wake up with two thoughts. The first thought is, shit, I'm still alive, you know. And the second one is, I need a drink, you know. But I woke up this morning, and I was reciting the ABCs. It's right after chapter 5 at every meeting. I see, I've been to so many of these damn meetings, you guys have poisoned my mind. <laughs> And I thought, this is an awfully peculiar thing to be thinking about, you know. And I started thinking about that. It's the first three steps is all that is, you know. And it said that I'm powerless over alcohol. Now, I know I'm an alcoholic. At this point in my life, the courts have referred me to the mental health. They're in the process of making a decision where they're going to make me a ward of the state of California at the age of 36 years old because it's become quite apparent to everybody that I was a danger to myself and others, and I could not manage my life. I knew I was an alcoholic. There was no doubt about that. But in the, in the, the 12 by 12 talks about it. He says, that don't matter. It talks about to my innermost self in here where I live, where no one else can see. It don't matter what I admit to you or what someone else says to me. And I thought about that. What does that mean? You know, and all of a sudden, it was like I was watching a movie and I could remember that morning. And I got a thousand stories about powerless over alcohol. But I remembered that morning of me walking back on that bus with my little girl. I'm thinking about her, the way she looked at me, and how I felt inside when I had to spend her food money on my alcohol. And then it hit me right here where I live, down deep inside. And I understood that when I put alcohol in my body, from that point on, it does not matter about who I love, about what I love. It don't matter about my dreams, my plans. It sure as hell don't matter about yours. That I got to do whatever alcohol says to do, and it always says the same thing. It says, get me some more. You know, and I'm willing to give up anybody or anything to get it. So that no human power is ever going to fix me. I always hoped one of you gals in AA would fix me, you know. A few of you tried. I've always been grateful, but... <laughs> Didn't work out too well for either one of us. Seldom does. <laughs> and I got real scared, you know. I thought about um, Department of Corrections. I thought about the mental health units, the churches, the good people, and all the people, and women, and, and men, and my children, and a couple of wives, and a bunch of lighthouse keepers, and a whole bunch of other people all across the United States that had reached out and tried to help me, and how hard I had tried for six years. Might have been much, but I kept trying, and I wanted to not drink. I really did. In my heart of hearts, I wanted to not drink. And there was no human power in this world that could stop me from drinking when this thing said it's time to drink. I always thought someone was going to say something someday or someone was going to give me the magic formula and it would take that away. 
And I suddenly realized, because see, I, this God stuff, I thought that was a bunch of shit, you know. The world I come from, there was no God, I'll tell you. And if there was a God, he certainly had a perverse sense of humor. And I didn't want anything to do. God was for that people to live up in the suburbs, you know. Not for people like me. I just pissed him off all my life, you know. I tried to make a deal with God in prison several times. He didn't cut me no slack. He didn't cut me no slack. I tried to make a deal with God with my son, with my brother, with a thousand other stories. God never gave me any of that stuff, you know. So when you guys started talking about God, I didn't know what you're talking about. It says this, that no human power but God could and would if he were sought. And I started thinking about what that means. And I started thinking about the people who had what I wanted. And it wasn't their money, it wasn't their women, it wasn't their cars. It was the way they conducted themselves in this world. The way they walked straight ahead and a certain look in their eye. And the way I watched them walk through difficulties that I could not imagine. And they did it with dignity. And they didn't drink and they didn't run. And all these people had one thing in common. They talked about this power that did for them what they could not do for themselves. I got down on my knees that morning and I said this little simple prayer and it was the most sincere moment of my life. I said, you know, I don't know who you are and I don't know what you are. And I don't think it makes any difference. But from this point on, I will do whatever you put in front of me if I do not have to drink or use any narcotics. And if you are not there, I'm screwed. And all I can tell you is this, is that the longer I've been sober, and it hasn't been that long, I feel like the real newcomer, some of the speakers we've had here, you know, I've only been sober a short while. But it's been, the more I've been, I know what a blessing was given me that morning, and I believe in grace because something happened right then and there, and it was the first time in my adult life that I knew I was going to be able to walk through that day without taking a drink. I didn't have any doubt about it. I knew that I could stay sober that day if I kept that simple concept. I went to that old man who asked, who busted me, you know, and told me that I was scared, old Charlie Tuck. And I knocked on his door and I said, Charlie, he goes, what do you want, son? And he said, I said, I don't want to drink no more. He said, what are you willing to do? I said, absolutely anything. He says, come on in. I sat down and his lovely wife, Edie, she made me, I was shaking so bad and she brought me some orange juice and some honey. And she came over and she gave me a kiss. She was the sweetest gal in the world. And he sat there and he said, Kip, and he says, are you done? And I said, Charlie, I said, I pray to God I'm done. And he says, that's the right answer. He goes, Kip, he says, I've been watching you for a long time. And people like you don't get sober. Not even an Alcoholics Anonymous. Very few of you. You have brave grave, grave damage to your very soul, your psyche. Something inside of you is broken. He says, you have the capacity to be honest with yourself. If you have the capacity to study and learn these steps and follow me, there might be some hope, but I'm going to tell you that it's going to have to be like this for you. That your recovery and your sobriety is going to have to be more important than any human being in this world. It's going to have to be more important than your children. It's going to have to be more important than any woman. It's going to have to be more important than any dog, any job, or anything in this world. And the day that you think anything in this world is more important than you doing the things that you have to do to maintain your sobriety, that's the day you're going to take another drink and you'll never, ever get back here. Old Charlie was the director of the Hospital Institutional Committee. This man drove 1,500 miles a week carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to institutions, correctional facilities. And he got me involved in that at 30 days. And my sponsor was one of the old kind of sponsors I've heard all throughout this conference. He didn't care how I felt. He wanted to know what I was doing, you know. I'd call him up with an earth-shaking problem, and he had let me get about halfway through and he'd say, hey, there's a guy named Bob at the Thursday night meeting. He's outside the front door and he's shaking real bad. He ain't got no money. He's expecting you. You go sit with him, get him some coffee, take him after the meeting and feed him and let him and sit with him till the bars close. I'd say, but I got a problem. And he'd hang up on me. And he'd take the phone off the hook, you know. And I'd go meet this guy and I'd go sit with this guy. And I'd call him back and I'd say, I got a resentment the next day. He goes, about what? Well, I had a problem yesterday, you know, and I called you. He goes, well, what was the problem? And I go, 
Uh, I don't know, but it wasn't right, you know. And, uh, I come home. And he, the deal, he'd say, Kip, he says. I just walk in the door. He goes, the main speaker out at the brig can't make it tonight. And there's a guy on his way to pick you up. And so get your coat. And he'd hang up, take the phone off the hook. <laughs> I'm coming up on 90 days. He said, well, I said, Charlie, I almost got 90 days. He says, so what? I said, well, I don't have to go to the meetings every night. He said, who told you that? <laughs> I said, well, all these uh, 90 meetings in 90 days, you know, he goes, yeah, but remember me and you were talking, you told me you weren't like them people? He goes, you're right, you're not. He said, you keep going to those meetings till I tell you to stop. I married a woman program of Alcoholics Anonymous, a lady that I was to experience love for a, a woman with all of my heart and unconditionally. And we, it just so happens we happen to get sober on exactly the same day. And she comes from the same place I do. And she, I fell absolutely head over heels in love with this woman. And, uh, and we got married. And between us we had six children. And this, that's what we had. We had six children and a desire to stop drinking. <laughs> and that's all we had. <laughs> and Charlie tells me, he says, you know, you're doing all these menial little jobs. It's time for you to get a real job. So I got a job. My parents' business is sport fishing, and they run boats out of San Diego. And they're the only people in the world that would give me a real job. And, and, and these private party boats, I mean, people get drunk out there. That's the whole object, you know. You charter the boat for yourself. You bring all your friends. You get a keg of beer, get a pile of dope, and go out there and play buccaneer, you know. And, uh, and he says, Kip, he says, you know, because I'm still having trouble with this God concept. He says, you better get a God. You can't have mine. And uh, so I'm down there. I'm still confused about this stuff. And I'm getting ready to get on the boat. I'm seeing them load the liquor up and everything. And... And I've been out there many, many times, and I know it's a real dangerous place. And he's, I look up, and there's this pelican flying over me. And I don't know if you've got many pelicans in Memphis, but uh, <laughs> down where I live, we've got a lot of them. If you ever get to see, can't see one, check out the way they look at you when they fly over your head. It looks just like these old-timers at these meetings. They look down at you like this. <laughs> they got a certain look in their face. And I was real messed up, and I said, uh, oh! Okay, something's looking out for me. I just felt it, you know. And that might sound real strange to you, but I'll tell you this, that I worked on that boat for one year, every single day, and every day that I thought about drinking, there was a pelican sitting right in the water, right next to me, walking, one eye cocked like this. <laughs> and that got me through my first year. And I was at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every single day, and I went to work every single day. And that's what my sponsor said. He said, you go to work every single day, and you go to a meeting every night, and your life will change. And he made me go to not just the meetings. I had to go to step studies. I had to go to book studies. I had to go to men's meetings, you know. He wouldn't let me go to a speaker meeting unless I was speaking. <laughs> and he kept me real active, you know, and all the things happened at three years sober. The state of California gave me my driver's license back. Just another part I didn't tell you about, but... Uh... My last 502, I had many, many of them, was .49, and I had a bad accident, and it really pissed them off. They said I'd never have a driver's license in the state of California as long as I live, you know, and uh, they gave me my license back. I'd been, after I had, the second year, they asked me, if, my sponsor said, it's time to get off that boat and get another job. It's time for you to learn a real trade. And I said, I don't know how to do anything. He says, you know how to pray? And I said, yep. He says, all right, get on your knees and tell God that you need to learn a trade. Tell him I sent you and go get one. <laughs> and I said, I ain't got a car, Charlie. He says, you got two feet? Start moving. God can't steer a parked car. You know? I got down on my knees. I said, God, I got to learn a trade. Charlie says, I got to do something. I'll take whatever you got. I walked out the door. I lived right behind this little honky-tonk. Walked out to the front street. This pickup pulled up. Rolled down his window, he says, hey, you want a job? Scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Tried to talk my way out of it. I said, I, you know, I ain't got a car. You know, and he said, that's all right. My shop's around the corner. 
He goes, I said, well, what is it? He goes, I'm a painting contractor. I said, I hate to paint. He goes, that's okay. I'll teach you. So I went back and I called Charlie. I said, Charlie, I got a job. Ten minutes later, I'm thinking he's going to be impressed. He said, what is it? I said, it's painting. He goes, that's a good job for you. You don't have to think very much. You know? And he popped me in. This was the head guy who had one of the biggest painting contractor businesses in Southern California. He hired over 150 men. I don't know if you all met many painters, but I'll tell you what. We got a lot of alcoholics in that trade. <laughs> and the ones that aren't alcoholics are absolute drug addicts. <laughs> and they're all perverts, you know. And, uh, and he, I was the only sober person in this whole crew. And it was like going there on Monday morning. It was like going down to San Diego detox, you know. And uh, <laughs> And I'd go to work with these guys, and my sponsor said, you've got to make a commitment. You're going to work for this man for a minimum of one year. He says, you'll never, ever refuse anything he tells you to do. You'll be the very first one there every morning with a good attitude. You'll greet everybody there with respect and courtesy. You'll never ask him how much they're paying you. Whatever he pays you is more than your worth. And I'm looking for an angle. And he covered every one of them. He says, you'll never quit and you'll never give him a reason to fire you. And I went to work for this man. And, and after a little while, you know, this guy comes up to me in this meeting and he says, uh, you're in that A&A, aren't you? I said, why? I don't cop to nothing. And, uh, he said, you're always smiling. He said, I know about you. I know people who know you. I've heard some things. I said, you don't, get, you don't drink with us at work. You don't get high. You take that book at lunchtime and you go sit and read that book. I know what that book is. I said, yeah, how do you know that? He goes, well, I've been in AA. I said, yeah. You still go? He said, no, I can't go back. I said, how come? He says, well, you know, he says, I, I just couldn't get sober. I went in there and I had to keep raising my hand because I kept getting drunk. And it was just too embarrassing to go back. I said, really, how long did you do that for? He said, God, I did it for almost six months. <laughs> I started laughing. I told him about my six years of doing that. And I said, I'll tell you what, Steve. I said, why don't you come over to my house on Wednesday nights? And uh, my wife, she goes to a women's meeting that night. And I usually stay home because I can't get out. I have a horrible time getting to a meeting. Why don't you come on over? Me and you'll sit at the back door of this bar. And we'll read this big book. And after 30 days, you can sneak back in the meetings. You won't have to raise your hand. Nobody will know. And I said, if you change your mind, I'll buy you a drink. You know. And uh, So he came over. Steve started changing. After a while, another guy came over. And after a while, another guy came over. That's now the Vista Mint's hole in wall. It's 150 minutes, one of the most active groups of Alcoholics Anonymous in San Diego. And, you know, I have nothing to do with it. God put me in. That's the way God has always worked in my life in recovery. He's put me in a place where I could be of service to my fellow man and to myself both at the same time. You know, at three years sober, that little girl that was born when I was in prison, I got a phone call and she said, Your name Kip? I said, Yeah. She goes, I'm your daughter, and I want to get to know you, and I want you to meet your grandchildren. And I went and met that little girl, and I met my grandchildren, and I made amends to her the best I could, and I held her in my arms that I'd waited for 23 years to hold. And I got to love her, and I got to love those children. And that little boy, that little boy, I brought him in, and I watched him graduate from high school at the age of 22 years old. And they said that could never happen. We were involved in Special Olympics. I mean, he made the state championship of bowling. He was in everything. We crammed as much in 10 years in his life as someone with a severe handicaps could possibly have. You know, and we did all those things. We built a boat together. We went to Mexico camp and we went on those fishing trips and we did all that stuff. And we went to church every single Sunday. And we went bowling every Sunday afternoon. And he grew up the last 10 years of his life in Alcoholics Anonymous and he understood unconditional love. And everybody knew him. And I got to see my son look at me the way I always dreamed he would, you know. And that little girl I drug around the country. A man came up to me one day, a little nice fellow, and he said, I'd like to ask your daughter's hand in marriage. And I looked him in the eye and I said, you drink? <laughs> he says, no, sir. And I said, okay. He said, you can marry my daughter on one condition. I said, what's that? I said, if you ever raise your hand in anger at my daughter, you keep moving and change your name. I said, do you understand? He said, yes, sir. I said, okay. <laughs> and I gave my daughter a wedding, the kind of wedding I dreamed about. 
Every month, for the rest of my life, I'll be paying on this credit card. <laughs> my grandchildren will be paying on it. And I gave her the kind of wedding, and I walked her down the aisle that I dreamed about. And she looked at me the way I dreamed about her looking at me. I, went to, I spoke in Australia in 1993. And I came back from Australia, and I, it was... Uh, I could not believe I started doing an inventory in my life, and I said, how can you possibly get from where I started to where I am? I owned my, became a painting contractor. I made a lot of money. I became a member of a church, and I loved it, and I was respected there. I was respected in my community. I was in several community projects. I've not only gotten involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, I've gotten involved in everything. I had a lot of amends to make. And a lot of them were to my community. And every, I had the woman of my dreams. You know, I had everything I ever dreamed about having, and I could not believe it. And I was reading in the newspaper, and I'm reading about this man who broke into this woman's house, and he tied her up, and he raped her, and he did all these horrible things, and then he took a knife to her and cut her to pieces. And I got down to her, and it was my daughter. And I'll tell you all this, that I'm absolutely perfectly capable of first-degree murder if you touch one of my children. And I went to the hospital. And a man had broke into her house and he did things to this woman that were unspeakable. She lost her right arm. She lost her breast and most of her face. And I walked into that hospital room and I saw my baby, the one who I was born when I was in prison, who I had just built this relationship. And I saw this thing that did not even look human. And I was filled with a rage beyond rage. And the way my anger works, you see, I don't go crazy. I start making plans, very cold and calculating. And this ice water took over, and I can't sleep, and I'm making plans. But the cops got this guy, and I know how to get at him, and I know how this works real well. I got no problem in this area. My sponsor says, what are you going to do? I said, I'll handle this. And uh and I'm nuts, and I'm crazy, and I can't sleep. I have to read this book, and it's, I had to read it. I couldn't figure out what was going on, and I got to this part about resentments. You know what? I had searched through and through that book, and it doesn't say that I can be resentful if someone rapes my daughter. It tells me that resentments will kill me, Period. It says me, if I live in anger, if I live with all that stuff, it'll cut me off from the sunlight of the Spirit and the insanity will return and I'll drink again. And then I have to get right back to what my sponsor told me when I first got here, that nothing, absolutely nothing in this world can be more important than me being sober. Not my kids, not anything in this world. But if I drink, I throw everything away. It's all gone. And I can't go live in that world one more time and do the things that I used to do and do it sober. And the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life was get down on my knees and pray for that man that did that to my daughter. And I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to lie to you, and I'm not going to tell you I forgive him. But I'll tell you this, that anger and that rage and that insanity went away. And I was able to go be a father to my daughter, and I was able to be a grandfather to my grandchildren. And I gave them the kind of help the first time in her life that she needed me more than she ever needed me. I was there for her with all the resources she needed. You know, and that's what I owed Alcoholics Anonymous. You guys gave me that. Right after that, I came home, and, and they told me that I had cancer, and they told me they are going to cut off my lips. I'm real attached to my lips. <laughs> my sponsor, I'm, I was fearful. Of, you know, they say the big C word, malignant, and you just go, ah! you know, and, uh, and I'm full of fear, and I have to go to the, my sponsor, and he says, go to the doctor. Go to get another opinion. And I went there. He said the same thing. He says, go to another one. I went to another one. He said, well, you know what? We can do this surgery. And um, he was a plastic surgeon and a specialist in this area. And I had the surgery done, and, you know, and it worked out successfully. It was very painful. And I told him I can't use any kind of drugs or anything like that, that I did this with Novocaine and aspirin, and I will never do that again. <laughs> no. Never, ever, <laughs> with a solemn oath. I got through that, and I didn't have to drink, and I didn't have to use, and, uh, and I came home, and I noticed there had been something going on with my wife. I couldn't put my finger on it, just something was different, and I didn't know. 
And I come in, and, and she said those words us guys just hate to hear when we first walk in the door. They look at you and they go, we have to talk. <laughs> you know it's not about something wonderful. You know? And she sat down, and she looked at me, and she started crying. And uh, I said, what's the matter, Connie? She said, Kip, she goes, you know, I love you. She goes, you're the best man in my life. She goes, you're everything I ever wanted in a man. And if I wanted a man, it'd be you. She goes, but I'm in love with this woman, and, and something's going on inside of me that I ain't got no control over, and, uh, and I'm leaving you. And, uh, and my wife uh, came out of the closet as a lesbian and, and joined the lesbian community with this woman, and, and I did not know how to react to this, you know. I have no tools for this. No one prepared me for this. You didn't tell me this was going to happen. In that book, it said, you know, if I do everything right, I'll get everything I thought it said. <laughs> and I got angry and I said things that weren't kind. And I couldn't sleep and I couldn't eat. And I'm nuts one more time and I have to go back and I have to read about resentments. I have to look about anger. I have to look about that one page. One thing a lot of people forget, and it's at the very bottom of page 62 where it says, here's the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. If anyone's having trouble finding God, quit playing Him. <laughs> He, he finds it very amusing, but, uh, you know, I, I can't find God, but they're walking around trying to direct this, direct that. They're pissed off this isn't going. They can't find God. I don't know. Here's the how and the why. But first of all, I had to quit playing God. And I had to do an inventory on that. And I had to do it. The only thing, the only love I've ever known other than my children is what you people gave me. And what you gave me was unconditional love. You didn't ask about my sexuality when I came here. You didn't ask about anything about me. You asked me if you have a desire to stop drinking, and then you people love me. And you loved me in spite of the things I did. I mean, if you could be kicked out of Alcoholics Anonymous, I guarantee you I wouldn't be here. I have stolen your money. I've passed out. I've chased your women. I've done everything in this world wrong that you can do in an AA meeting, and you haven't kicked me out yet, you know? And you just love me. And the only thing I know about love is from my children and from Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I have to do it in inventory. Do I love this woman or do I feel like I own her? Am I in charge of her sexuality? Am I in charge of her life? Or do I love her? And I, have to, I love this woman with all my heart. And if that's what she needs, that's her business. It has nothing to do with me. Today that woman is one of my dearest, dearest friends. We're divorced. She's married to a lady. And they both come over to my house. I cook better than both of them. You know, and, uh, and we're dear friends. We're all members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll tell you what, only things like that can happen in AA. You know? <laughs> my son, we were at the State California Champion Bish Bowling, you know, and it was just me and my son, and everything else was gone, you know. And, uh, and my son got sick at the playoffs, and I had to take him to the hospital. May 25th, 1993. And I took him to the hospital and they admitted him and they did a little surgery on him. And my son got a staph infection in his blood. And I sat with him and I held him for four months around the clock in that hospital. And the members of Alcoholics Anonymous were there with me. And they spelled me and on November 4th he died in my arms. And I'll tell you this, that at that moment when my son died, I had to make the decision to turn off the life support machine. I experienced a new serenity and a new peace. And I understood what serenity means. I don't know what it means to you, but I know what it means to me. Serenity doesn't have anything to do with uh, watching a beautiful sunset with her or him in a pocket full of money. Serenity to me was absolute, total acceptance of God's will, whatever happens in my life. That God loves me with all of his heart. I am God's favorite kid. I have no doubt about it. He has never hid anything from me in this world. I've got to experience everything there is to experience, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And out there, nothing's ever been hidden from me. And I found out that I could 
watch someone I love more than anything, and more than my own life, more than anything in this world, I could watch them die and know that that was God's business and I could cry and hurt worse than I knew you could possibly hurt, but still inside be at peace. And after he passed on, I shaved him and I cleaned him up and I got him all ready for the mortuary and him and my sponsor got down on my knees. And I thank God and I thanked Alcoholics Anonymous and I thank all of you because, you see, you gave me those ten years to be with my son, to be the kind of father I dreamed about being. I was there. I made good decisions and good choices. I was there for my daughters, both of them. You know, and I walked out of there And I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had no money. My home group, the Vista Men's Hole in the Wall, passed the basket one time, raised $12,000 between these men. And they gave my son one of the biggest funerals I've ever been to, and there was 250 cars there and 55 motorcycles. You know. And it was a grand going out party. You know, and I... And I didn't deserve that. You know, I, 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 how, how do you get from there, from where I come from? That many people that cared about me and my family. You know, I didn't know what to do after all that was gone. Everything in my life was gone. The, the, job, the job had gone. The work had gone. The money had gone. Uh, my health had gone. My wife had gone. The kids were gone. It was just me. So I, I only went to the seventh grade. I decided to go to school. Now I'm an alcoholic, so I'm going to go to college. <laughs> So I went to this university. I told them what I wanted to do, and I wanted to get a bachelor's degree in this length of time. They said, you can't do that. I said, why? And they said, well, that's just too much. So the next two years, I did 24 units a quarter with no breaks. And went to high school at the same time, and, and I got my high school diploma and my bachelor's degree in two and a half years. And... Um, <laughs> I owe that to you. You know, I, I said, how do I go to school? He goes, the same way you went to AA. The teacher's your sponsor. He's going to tell you to write, write. He's going to tell you to read, read. Sit down, shut up, and listen. <laughs> Suit up and show up every day. Just like AA. And that's the way I did it. Because that's the only thing I know is what I've learned in these rooms. And I went to school and I did what they told me. And I, and I, and I got a job working in a hospital. And I, I, I do real well there. I have another job that I work in a... Um, in construction business and marketing. I'm a national construction company, and I'm very well paid there, and I get to do a lot of traveling. And, uh, and my life is good. I have a little tiny house, and I have my dog, and, and my life is good, and I wouldn't trade places with anything. You know, I have not allowed another human being to come into my heart of hearts for a long, long time. You know, that area was real damaged, and, um, and I loved you all, but I couldn't let anyone get too close. You know, there was a lot of healing that had to take place. And I needed someone, and I know that if I need someone, that's not healthy for them or me, you know. About six months ago, I was feeling a little lonely, and I was feeling real comfortable with myself. And my sponsor told me that I could have another relationship as soon as I didn't need one, you know. So I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I said, you know what, if it's your will, it don't make no difference to me. But if it's okay with you, it's okay with me for you to bring love back into my life one more time. My God has a real funny sense of humor. (laughs) I'm thinking of some woman, beautiful, lots of money. There was a gal that I was going out with and we were having a good old time. And I got a phone call four months ago, and uh, she said, her mother called and said, my daughter's been in a very, very bad car accident. She went drinking one more time. She was a sober member of this program, and she got in a horrible car wreck. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, Kip, but you and her have a daughter together. And I went, what? She goes, yeah, you have an eight-month-old daughter. And there's no one to take care of that baby, and she can't no more. And uh, two and a half months ago, I became a single father one more time. <laughs> and God brought love back into my life. You know. <laughs> and she's the 
sunshine of my life, you know, and uh, it's just me and her and my dog, and uh, and we have a good time, you know, and I'll tell you what, you hear another miracle, you know where she's at right now? She's with my ex-wife and her wife. <laughs> They went to a pumpkin patch, you know, party. Uh, there ain't nobody in the world I trust more than her with my daughter. You know, and I, she's a good woman. I tell you this, you new people, I don't know a lot. I know the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. As outlined in the first 164 pages, will work for absolutely anybody, anywhere, under any circumstances. It don't matter where you've been. It don't matter what you've done or what you ain't done. If you're willing to live by these principles, things will happen in your life you will not believe. You will never have to run from anything again, chemically or geographically. It will teach you how to live in this world one day at a time, very comfortably, no matter what happens. You know, I know this, too. I know that no matter what i got to do to stay sober, it sure as hell is easier to stay sober than to get sober. You know? I'll leave you with this one thing. My, pro- my sponsor gave me one more promise. It wasn't in the book. And he told me this. He says, if you will live by these principles, there'll become a time when someday, in about midnight, when there ain't no one to oppress, just you, and you're going to walk by a mirror and you're going to see the guy looking back that you always wanted to be when you were that nine-year-old kid. And I ain't going to tell you I'm any big deal, you know, because I ain't. But I'll tell you this, as a result of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 traditions and the 12 concepts of Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, an excellent sponsor in the work that I have done and a loving God. I am the best human being I have ever been in my life in every aspect of it. You know, and I owe that to you. And I want to thank you all for letting me come here and your hospitality. And uh, that's it.